Welcome back. Neural integration. So we just talked about synapses, different kinds of synapses, uh, cholinergic, adrenergic, and GABAergic. So excitatory and inhibitory kinds of synapses. Um, the more synapses a neuron has, the greater its information processing capability. The synapses are the decision-making components of the nervous system. And you can increase your synapses and you can, um, you can make actions over and over and you can make memories easier to recall in that way. And neural integration, that's when neurons integrate with each other, send signals back and forth. Uh, it's based on types of postsynaptic potentials that are produced by neurotransmitters. So the greater the synapses, uh, the greater the information processing capability. So cells, for example, cells in the cerebral cortex. Do you remember where the cerebral cortex is from the brain dissection? Here, let me put the chat on and then um, I'll be able to see if you're asking any questions. Oh, a question was, are you sending the project that you just did in? You are not sending it in. Cells in the cerebral cortex, the cerebral cortex is the most external part of the brain. That is also uh, the, where your gray matter resides. And gray matter are cell bodies and dendrites. And that's where a lot of integration takes place. There are association pathways between the lobes of your brain. So cells in the cerebral cortex, uh, some have They can have 40,000 synapses, for example. Individual cells, the cerebral cortex itself uh, may have 100, tr 100 trillion synapses. A hundred trillion synapses or more. And you can increase the number of synapses by having an enriched environment, uh, by taking courses like this, by studying, by reading, by writing, uh, by walking, by doing uh, especially experiential kinds of things, uh, making things, drawing, art. All of those can increase your synapses. So the ability We said before that these integration interneurons are capable of processing, storing, and recalling information, ability to store, process, and recall information depends on synapses. neural integration. Synapses. So far, we've been talking about excitatory and inhibitory synapses. So they translate into postsynaptic potentials. If there's loads of inhibitory synapses, there won't be an action potential. If there are loads of um, excitatory synapses, there could very well be an action potential. So we call those um, respectively excitatory, postsynaptic potentials, You know, the big question is, will 
this neuron fire or have an action potential or will it not? So excitatory are the types of potentials where there will be action potentials, excitatory. Inhibitory, postsynaptic potentials, So these are your local potentials, the postsynaptic potentials. They're local. And inhibitory postsynaptic potentials are more likely to inhibit an action potential. It'll, it will make it more difficult for the cell to reach minus 55 millivolts. So, Excitatory, EPSP. It's a positive voltage change. So minus 70 millivolts is the resting potential. It'll be a positive change. So it will go perhaps up to initially a minus 60 and then minus 55, a positive voltage change causing the postsynaptic cell to be more likely to fire or have an action potential. And it's results from, what is the name of the, um, the ion that will flow into the cell? What is the positive ion that will flow into the cell to create a positive voltage change? Yes, sodium, sodium enters the cell. Excellent. And some neurotransmitters um, are, excitatory and and some are not glutamate is an excitatory one um, aspartate is another one they're excitatory neurotransmitters just put nt for neurotransmitters the inhibitory postsynaptic potential that is a negative voltage change. So the voltage change will be in the negative direction. Um, it will go from minus 70 to perhaps minus 80, minus 85 millivolts. That's also known as, what's another word for that? It starts with an H. A negative voltage change, such so an H. What do you mean more? Something polarization. What kind of polarization would it be? Hyper, hyper polarization. Hyper polarization. And that is a result of what flowing into the cell? What will flow into the cell? What negative ion? Chloride, good. It could also be the results of potassium leaving the cell. That is another mechanism by which that could occur. leaving the cell. A glycine and GABA are inhibitory neurotransmitters. And you might be asking yourself, 
Well, how then does the neuron know what will happen? There's all these ions coming in. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. Um, they're juxtapositionally <laughs> opposed to one another. Yeah. So what will happen? What will happen? We call that a summation, a summation of postsynaptic potentials. So the net postsynaptic potentials in the trigger zone depends on the net input of other cells. So, mm, these, these potentials are summed up. So all of the negative potentials are summed up, all of the positive potentials are summed up. And then whichever one has more has the net effect. And there are two kinds of summation, temporal, that means over time, and spatial, that means in an area, a particular area. So I wanted to show you what this looks like. I think I can do that. I have a demonstration set up. So I just have to point this to the demonstration. Although I can't make this any closer. So I hope you can see what's going on. But um, if I have a temporal summation, so here are over time, there's a positive one. This is water. I'm just pouring it in here. There's another positive one. And oh, here's another one. So I did three different uh, potentials, one at a time. That's temporal. That's over time. Um, if there's an inhibitory one, well, it might go back. But then there might be another one coming in at, over time. And that's called temporal summation. Um, spatial summation is such that here are potentials coming in from two different areas at the same time. And that by, might be enough to bring the potentials up to threshold. <laughs> A little bit more difficult to do demonstrations on Zoom. So does that, um, does that make sense? The temporal and spatial summations. I can write that down. So whether, I've already written that above, but I'll write it again, what the heck. Whether a neuron fires or has an action potential depends on the net input of other cells, other neurons. So a typical excitatory postsynaptic potential uh, has a voltage of about 0.5 millivolts and lasts about 20 seconds. Sorry, 20 milliseconds, sorry, not 20 seconds, 20 milliseconds. So a typical neuron would need 
30 or so excitatory postsynaptic potentials to reach the threshold. So if it's temporal summation, it will have to receive those in quite quick succession. Boom, 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 boom. All in a row, very quickly, in order to reach threshold. If it's spatial summation, then it will need, say, about 30 occurring at the same time in order to reach threshold. So here's what a summation might look like on a graph. Your y-axis is um, millivolts. That's across the plasma membrane. And the x-axis is time. Here are your incoming excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And they're adding up here because not, not enough time has, has gone by for them to diminish and they've reached threshold, and so there's depolarization up, and up to the peak. And of course, after that, when the potassium channels open, there will be repolarization and a slight hyperpolarization till we get back to resting potential. So is this, is this a spatial or a temporal summation? What do you think? Is it spatial or temporal? Is it spatial or temporal? Good, it is temporal. Uh, we have time on the x-axis and it shows that the potentials are coming in one after the other there. Good, good. There is such a thing as presynaptic inhibition. Inhibition. A neurotransmitter that inhibits um, any kind of neurotransmitter release. One suppresses another one. In this case, it could be, it could be uh, GABA that's released from um, the inhibitory neuron. And that prevents calcium channels from opening. So that is another mechanism of GABA. It is a presynaptic inhibiting neuron. So a big question is, how do you know? How does your brain know what's going on? What kind of information is the brain getting through all these synapses? What is the information the brain is getting? Sure, there's lots of action potentials. And um, say you have just bitten into a lemon. What would your face do? <laughs> we'll go, ah, you'd have, you'd have a, a response, of course, because it's quite sour. Or say you, you a bite into um, some, something that's not too sweet, <laughs> then you'll have a slight response. If you bite into something that's very sweet, then you'll have a greater response. But how does your brain know that you've just eaten something that's very sweet? So that's called neural coding. So this is how the brain interprets the potentials that are coming in, the action potentials that are coming in. So that's called neural coding. Qualitative information, whether or not something is salty or sweet or sour or umami, 
it depends on which neurons are fired. So you have very particular taste buds for very particular molecules. So that's qualitative. But quantitative information, is it, is it very sweet or just a little bit sweet, depends on um, exciting many different neurons, so recruitment and a more rapid firing rate. So the central nervous system, your brain in particular, judges the stimulus strength from the frequency of sensory neurons. So for example, instead of having just six uh, action potentials per second, there's 600 action potentials per second. That tells you, oh my goodness, that is really, really sweet. That's called neural coding. So it is an electrical kind of system. If you think of neurons as being wires, there are signals going down those wires, they're triggering other wires, and they are circuits. And they're sometimes named after electrical circuits. So a neuronal pool is thousands to millions of interneurons, and they share a specific body function like, say, breathing. Breathing isn't just one simple, straightforward thing. Breathing is your diaphragm, your intercostal muscles of your ribs, the signal that you are increasing carbon dioxide in your blood. So there are a number of things going on. So that's a pool. And in this pool, um, there are different zones. I don't think this is terribly important at the moment, but in a discharge zone, a single cell can produce firing. But in a facilitated zone, uh, it just makes it easier for the postsynaptic cell to fire. But more interestingly, there are different kinds of circuits. And these are very common. So for example, a diverging circuit. That means that one cell synapses on, um, sorry, on many other cells. This whole sentence doesn't really make sense, I don't think. Synapses on many. And that carries on through the circuit. So here's one cell and it's synapsing onto three and they each are synapsing onto two each. That's a diverging circuit. A converging circuit is such that signals from two cells here are converging on one and all these three are converging on another, a single cell. So you might expect to find a diverging circuit in an action like say, walking, walking or balance. So there is a, a signal in the brain that says, um, we should get out of here. So we should walk somewhere. But in order to walk somewhere, you have to signal to many different muscles. So that's a diverging circuit. You're signaling to the muscles in your feet and in your legs and in your back and even your arms. So that, so diverging tends to be a mo motor circuits. Whereas converging circuits tend to be uh, sensory in that the signal to walk, say something happens, um, there's a fire and you need to run away. Well, the signal that you're getting from the fire is from visual, you're seeing the fire, from smell, you're smelling the smoke, um, from, you know, heat. So many signals from different senses are accumulated to the brain.
neuronal circuits. There are different kinds. So those were diverging and converging. There are circuits known as reverberating circuits where neurons stimulate each other in a linear sequence. Uh, but one cell re-stimulates the first cell and starts the process all over, a reverberating circuit. Um, there's a prolonged effect. This kind of circuit is found, for example, um, in breathing. Also, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. So this is repetitive movement. So this is often, this is often, oh, where can I write that? I'll write it right here, repetitive movement or some kind of repetitive action. And then when, you, the, cir when the circuit stops, um, you exhale and when the circuit starts, you inhale. So uh, circuit stops, you inhale, circuit starts, you exhale. Sorry, it's so squished in there. Um, so the parallel after discharge kind of neural circuit is such that the um, the effect or the stimulus, the effect of the stimulus keeps going even after, even after stimulation ceases. So for example, have you ever um, looked at a light and then closed your eyes? What happens if you look at a light and then close your eyes? If you close, if you look at a bright light and then you close your eyes, can you see it still? Have you ever experienced that? Right, yes, usually you can, you can. So um, the output in this case continues for a while after the circuit stops, or after the stimulus, I should say, the stimulus stops, such as a lamp. So, so the light from a lamp is the stimulus. And you'll still be getting some of that signal even after you've closed your eyes. So what about memory? How can we improve our memory? So how did you learn to tie your shoes? When you, were a, when you were a child, did you just go, oh, this is easy. Here's two strings. I'm going to tie them together into these beautiful loops, and it'll be perfect the first time. <laughs> well, maybe some of you did. In that case, you are geniuses. Most people, however, cannot tie their shoes the first try. but uh, they, a child will keep trying and keep trying until they can tie their shoes. But memories aren't stored in individual cells. It's a pathway of cells. Memory is a pathway of cells. Uh, it's called, uh, called a memory trace. or uh, an n-gram, sometimes also called an n-gram. Um, synaptic potentation is the process of making transmission easier. And it's usually, it's often uh, as a result, can you see that okay? As a result of repetition. Repeating actions over and over, or repeating thoughts over and over. So, of course, that, that's, that's a great thing uh, when you're learning something useful. It can be not such a great thing 
if you're remembering um, um, antagonistic or difficult things like trauma that might have occurred in the past. So uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, for example, is a situation where those memories, they keep um, reinforcing those synapses and reinforcing them makes it more difficult to forget. So forgetting is as important as remembering. And there's a lot of things that uh, you forget because you just simply don't need them for your survival. But some experience or some experiences are such that they're very traumatic. And every time one remembers a traumatic experience, it reinforces that synapse. So the trick is, and my mom used to say this all the time, you have to replace, and this is very simplistic, of course, I don't really know much about psychology, but um, she said, replace any negative thoughts you have with positive thoughts. The more positive thoughts you have, those will reinforce your positive thoughts, which we know are better for you. Okay. Um, so potentation correlates with different forms of memory. There are different forms of memory. And those are immediate, short-term, and long-term. Immediate memory is the ability to hold something in your thoughts for just a few seconds. Now, why do you need immediate memory? Um, it gives you a feel for the flow of events, this, a sense of the present, what's going on. What just happened echoes in your mind for a few seconds. So if you're, for example, reading a sentence, you don't forget the first words of the sentence by the time you're at the end of that sentence. It seems to be reverberating circuits that uh, assist that kind of immediate memory. So there's just a bit of an echo in your mind for a few seconds. So that's one kind of memory. A short-term memory lasts from a few seconds to several hours. Um, it's a working memory. So it's a working memory. It allows you to keep something in your mind long enough to like search for keys or dial the phone, <laughs> dial the phone. This must be, this is an old lecture. Yeah, we don't dial phones much anymore, do we? I, I don't know if any of you are, no, you're definitely not old enough to remember the dial phones that took forever, especially if somebody's number had a lot of nines because the nine was like way down there. I, I'll show you a dial phone one day. I've got, I've got an old one that I got from a thrift store. <laughs> uh, anyhow, yeah, so if, if however you're distracted, during this short-term memory, it can make you forget what you were doing. So, so don't worry if, you, if distractions tend to make you forget what you're doing. Well, that's just really perfectly normal. And that's because of the, the type of circuits. Um, facilitation causes memory to be longer lasting because calcium accumulates. And when there's a lot of calcium, then that synapse is more likely to occur. Yeah, so that's called uh, synaptic facilitation. Post-Titanic potentation, <laughs> say that 20 times in a row. Uh, if you're drunk, forget about it. <laughs> um, that is a, a memory jogger. So because there are high levels of calcium, it makes it easy to fire. It makes it easy to fire. And the other kind of memory is long-term memory, which can last for a very long time. Uh, it can, it can, um, yeah, it can last forever. Um, Let's see, there are different kinds of long-term memory, different types. There is one known as declarative. Declarative, that's the retention of facts. Uh, words and text. 
The other one is known as procedural memory. And that is motor memory. So the retention of motor skills. And now you know why people that are practicing a dance move or practicing, um, um, I'm trying to think of a sport, of practicing kicking into a goal, for example, in soccer, they do it over and over and over again because the more they do it, the better they get at it. And the memory that they have, the muscle memory that they have is much more easily triggered in the spur of the moment. Because I don't know if you've ever done um, any... Um, um, <laughs> forgetting. This is funny because I'm forgetting some words. Um, if you've ever performed, um, yeah. So nervousness tends to inhibit memory, and so that's why if you're a performer, that you need to practice over and over and over again. And what's really important is that. You can remodel synapses with new branching of axons or dendrites. And even though in the brain you can't, you can't um, synthesize new neurons, but you can always, always synthesize new dendrites and branching. You can always do that. And you will do that, um, say, it, if there's a trauma to the brain, some kind of blunt trauma, course trauma, or a, a stroke, then recovery is possible because of this, because of uh, a re, re making new circuits, new circuits with dendrites. You can even remove an entire hemisphere of a brain and the other hemisphere will chip in, grow the new dendrites, and it's a longish process, but um, function can return. Oh, there's a question. What about the type of memory when your fingers can remember the password on the keyboard, but you can't remember the password with your head? Yeah, great, that, there you go. That's a great example. That your motor memory is terrific. Um, but your, your procedural memory is terrific. Your declarative memory, not so terrific at that very moment. <laughs> That's a great example. So molecular changes are called long-term potentation. So that is the stimulus, for example, of calcium. Of calcium. Uh, molecular changes may also be an increase in receptors. Um, a neuron producing more receptors. That has long term effects also. Um, yeah. Long term memory. So um, there are different kinds of memory loss also. So memory loss, which is collectively known as dementia, but there are many different kinds of dementia. Um, Alzheimer's is one particular type of dementia. Um, it is a fatal disease. It occurs approximately 11% of the population over 65, about 47% by the age of 85. Um, the symptoms are memory loss for recent events and also behavioral changes like moodiness, combativeness, and then unfortunately also the inability to um, trigger motor um, neurons. But you can't diagnose it 
until there's been an autopsy. So because dementia occurs uh, as a result of other things, uh, chemical imbalances, for example, um, lack of kidney function. So these things can lead to dementia, but it's diagnosed at autopsy. Uh, there's atrophy of gyri. So that means that the cerebral cortex gets smaller and smaller, and there's gaps, big gaps between the gyri. And there is such a thing as neurofibrillary tangles and plaques. So um, there is a genetic connection. Uh, there may be, sorry, I missed this, degeneration of cholinergic neurons and a deficiency in acetylcholine and nerve growth factors. So that may also occur with Alzheimer's disease. And yes, there is a genetic component. And I do have a short video. It is, however, 1252. I don't think I will show that at the moment. Another disease is known as Parkinson disease. Um, and there is, uh, I believe there's a good article or a good insight in the textbook about Parkinson's disease. So, but I'm not going to talk about that at the moment because I'd like to end the lecture there if that's okay. All right.